Hey, Under Pressure Dive Buddies. I want you to think about a time when you were really looking forward to something, something you were really excited about. Maybe you were looking forward to a great outcome for a project at work. Maybe you're looking forward to an upcoming holiday, or maybe you were looking forward to your next dive trip. What happens when things don't work out quite like you hoped or even remotely like you hoped? I was planning last weekend to go to Santa Rosa, New Mexico, and it turned out I had to cancel that trip kind of at the last minute. And it was a really, it was a bummer, but it also brought to mind to me the things we can consider to minimize the chance that we have to cancel a dive trip or to get the most out of a trip as it is and not necessarily as we expected it to be. So get your gear on because it's time for us to dive into another episode of the Under Pressure Divecast. I'm your host, Scuba Steve. I'm a recreational scuba instructor and what I like to call a scuba evangelist. Scuba diving is a fun and exciting adventure sport and you can be a scuba diver. And to help you get there, the Under Pressure Divecast is dedicated to promoting and discussing recreational scuba diving. As always, we're gonna have some scuba news, a topic of the day, and that's it. So come on, let's make our descent. Scuba news today. All right, so um, we're gonna make a couple of differences, a couple changes to the show, uh, very minor changes. Two, really one, we're gonna kind of round back to disappointment. So all this time, and if you'll notice on YouTube, you'll see that the show shows up in 4K. And ironically, my software distributes the show in 4K, my camera can shoot in 4K, but my switcher doesn't talk in 4K. So I've been thinking I was broadcasting in 4K this whole time, and I'm actually not. So I have an updated plan for that, looking forward to getting that implemented. Um, minor show thing for those of you who have been watching the video going, this does not look like 4K, uh, it's not your eyes, it's, that's real. Um, but in terms of the show format itself, uh, what we're gonna be looking at is, I'm gonna take out the section on tips and the section uh, that I call the Gear Junkies Garage, and I'm not going to eliminate that content, but I'm going to, uh, I, well, you'll probably have noticed that I kind of, it, it almost feels forced, and I, that, why? Okay, so if I talk about a piece of gear, it'll be in the main topic area. And if I have tips, I will provide them in the main topic area. This is gonna provide a more succinct episode. It's gonna feel more cohesive. And I think it's gonna deliver the content in a way that's more valuable and maybe more digestible to people. And if when I talk about a piece of gear or I have a tip for you, I will note it in the show notes, whether that's in the description on the podcast page or whether it's a, in the um, show notes, like in the timestamps on the YouTube uh, video, which I do a few days after this, by, I usually try to get it done within a few days after I deliver the show. So that's the show news for the week. Um, we're just trying to keep it simple and deliver it in 4K. We'll do 4K hopefully next episode. All right, industry news. There is a movie coming out today, October 22nd, 2021, called Becoming Cousteau. It's in theaters only, and it's about, obviously, the life of Jacques Cousteau. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Uh, not sure I'm ready to go to the movie theater yet, but that's okay. Uh, maybe, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get the courage to go out, or maybe I'll just wait until it's out uh, uh, on a streaming platform. But it, it's interesting and exciting for a lot of us because Jacques Cousteau was the one who introduced us to the underwater world, you know, and... Uh, you know, I remember sitting in front of the television when I was a kid uh, once a week, you know, just for that program. And so I'm really excited to learn more about this guy, um, somebody who really pioneered diving in, in every sense of the word. So if you're interested in, obviously, if you're, if you're uh, old enough to remember Jacques Cousteau, this will be a trip down memory lane for you. If you're not old enough, it might be still interesting. I think it would be interesting to really see somebody who was really was a pioneer uh, in the scuba industry and and not in just not just in the industry itself but in the preservation of the aquatic environment 
And so I, I would encourage anybody who's interested to just uh, take a look at that show. I will put a link to the trailer in the show notes as well. So that's pretty exciting. All right. And, and what, I guess, drop in the comments what, what your favorite show was, whether it's a movie or a television show. What is your favorite scuba-related television show or movie? All right. Let's get on to the main topic and talk about how we can manage our disappointment when it comes to diving. So I really believe that every diving opportunity has the opportunity to be a good one. But that doesn't mean we're never disappointed or that we never miss a dive. So let's talk a little bit about that trip I, I had scheduled to go to Blue Hole. In, in New Mexico. So this is a place, there's there's two places to dive down there. There's Blue Hole itself, which is a natural spring, and there's Perch Lake, which is just a little bit uh, a little bit away from, from the main Blue Hole itself. And I, I love this whole trip. I love the road trip. I love driving through New Mexico. I grew up in New Mexico, so it's, you know, nostalgic for me. I love the countryside. It's a great time to unwind and just sort of relax when you're on the road in that part of the country. It's not very busy and there's still traffic. Uh, you know, nowadays you can't really be on an interstate without traffic, but you know, there are opportunities to just kind of relax, let your mind wander a little bit as long as you're doing it safely. And, um, so I was looking forward to the trip a lot before I even, uh, you know, before I even got close to having to cancel the trip, I was checking out my gear and there was a tear in my dry suit. I said, I put a picture up on Instagram of a tear in the neck seal of my dry suit. I like to drive to dive blue hole in a dry suit. It's 63, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little chilly. Uh, so I like to use a, a dry suit for that. Uh, and, and so that was kind of a disappointment, but I was, you know, it was a week before the trip. I got the dry suit neck seal fixed. Um, then I got back in the water at the dive shop and my dry suit was leaking qu quite a bit actually. And I, you know, so I was already on the fence of, you know, is this a good idea or not? Now I could dive it in a wetsuit and just dive what I could, you know, and that would be okay. Um, and that was, I was prepared to do that. I was prepared to take my dry suit and if it got, if I le if it leaked too badly, then I could dive a wetsuit and just do what I could say, okay, I'm cold. I'm going to skip a dive, go warm up, whatever. And that, that would be fine. Um, but then my dog got sick and my wife was out of town. So it made sense for me to ultimately say, okay, this is enough things that are <laughs> going wrong where I just don't need to go. And so while I was disappointed, obviously sometimes you have to make choices that are, um, in the best interest of your dog. <laughs> and, and so, bummer, but okay. So what that brought to mind to me uh, though, is what things, you know, sometimes there are things outside of our control and, you know, there's some internal mental management where we can go, okay, how do we deal with, with that disappointment when we really can't control anything or can't control the thing that's going to cancel our dive. But what are some things that we can control that maybe we don't pay enough attention to, or that we aren't paying specific attention to in the midst of getting ready for a trip, especially if that trip is not specifically scuba related. If you're going to scuba dive on a trip where your other, uh, where you're focused on other things, um, sometimes these things can get missed and we do want to get the most out of our time in the water. So I I've broken it down into four causes of missed or disappointing dives. And so we're going to talk about each of these four. One is travel issues, two is gear issues, three is diving conditions, and four is personal health and fitness. So we'll talk about each of those things. So the first thing is travel issues. Traveling when you're scuba diving means taking a lot of gear. And so there's this, there's a risk that equipment can get damaged in, in uh, transit or lost in transit or other travel issues. You know, you can, you can uh, have a cancellation. Maybe your flight gets canceled. Maybe your, uh, maybe your whole trip gets canceled because your dog gets sick, right? That's okay. Um, that, that part's outside of your control. 
uh, maybe your operator has a problem. Maybe you get down to the dive location and uh, your dive operator's boat is broken. And, and I had that problem in um, Florida a couple of years ago. I was uh, on the pier with my gear along with a bunch of other divers and the dive operator had to go find another boat because their boat was broken and or the boat they were going to use that morning was broken. So uh, that put us out a little bit later than we expected to go. So, you know, you, you need to look at what travel issues you might have and what is your response to that? Some of those things are not going to be things you can control. Um, cancellations, delayed flights, those are things you need to respond to, not try to prevent or predict. Um, it'd be nice if we could prevent or predict them. Uh, you might consider travel insurance if you're going far away and you have the, 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 the means to, to, uh, to insure your trip so that you can uh, if it gets canceled, you can do it another time. I would caution you to look at the fine print on the travel insurance and make sure that the, the conditions under which it will honor its side of the commitment are conditions that you're comfortable with or find another provider. Um, that's just one thing. Uh, don't assume that your, your trip insurance is going to cover your scuba trip unless you've specifically looked at it. So travel issues is number one. The number two thing is gear issues. Uh, and, and this comes down to missing gear and broken gear, right? Stuff that doesn't work or stuff that doesn't show up. So if you put all of your dive gear in a bag on a plane and it gets there, that fixes problem number one. If it's broken, then, then you have problem number two. What do we do about this? Okay, so missing gear or broken gear can be handled at the local, uh, de at your destination. If your destination is a dive resort, um, it's likely to have the equipment so that you can dive. Now, is it going to have your exact piece of gear? Probably not, but unless you're doing something very, very specific and can't dive any other way, um, you know, then, and, and I would actually, let me, let me say this. If you're doing something so specific, uh, you're almost going to the point where it's probably outside of recreational scuba diving because you know there's equipment like rebreathers, uh, activities like cave diving. Those require equipment that a lot of dive destinations, a lot of resorts are not going to carry, but they're outside the scope of recreational diving. And so, you know, not really part of our discussions here, but I wanted to mention it. But if you're going to do simply uh, recreational scuba diving, most dive resorts and dive operators will have equipment that you can rent. It's not ideal if you own your own gear and you like it, but it is possible and it's something to consider. It's something to make sure is available or find out. So you call the dive operator and say, hey, I'm going to be there in April. I was going to do this dive with you guys. And, you know, what gear do you have uh, to rent? in case, and you can say, I'm bringing my own gear, but I'm just curious if something goes wrong. Do you have regulators? Do you have BCDs? Do you have mass fins and snorkel? Do you have, um, you know, do you have dive computers I can rent? And, and just go through the list and find out what they have and what they don't have so that you can adapt to the situation where gear doesn't get there in time or doesn't get there at all, or is broken, uh, or doesn't work. And, the, the other thing I would mention about gear is to make sure that you test it. So you get to your dive destination, you're super excited to be there, and you don't unpack your dive gear until the morning of the dive. I would really, really encourage you to do it the night before or even earlier than that. I mean, depending on your trip schedule, right? Is get your gear out as soon as you can, practically speaking, um, in your situation, get your gear out, put it on or do everything you can to test it. Go down to the to the to the uh, dive shop or or and, and get a tank. Test your regulator. Make sure nothing got damaged on the plane, in the bus, in the car, whatever it is. Just make sure that it's working. That gives you more time to recover if it's not. Even if you're not diving until the third day, if you get down. You spend a few minutes after dinner, the first night you're there, put your gear together and you go, oh, my regulator's not working. 
or my BCD is free flowing or uh, uh, no, it won't, it's leaking when I fill it up. Okay. If you can't fix it, do you have another option? Well, now you have a few days to deal with that instead of stepping and fetching on the morning you're supposed to be on the boat. There's a couple reasons for that. One, you're more relaxed because you are ready. Even if you're using rental gear, you're ready on the morning of the dive, which means that you're relaxed, your anxiety level's lower, you're gonna enjoy that dive more. Two, it's more respectful to, the, to your dive buddy and the other people on the boat because you're not late to the boat or, or uh, spreading your anxiety around as uh, you get on the boat and you're all just freaked out because you just got the new BC and you don't know how it works and you're trying to put it on the tank or whatever. This gives you the chance to do it in advance. Make sure you understand the gear, make sure you've had the chance to test it, fit it, make sure it's gonna fit you well so that you can make the dive. All right, so that's number two, gear issues. Number three is diving conditions. Now this is something we largely can't predict or, uh, or fix. Uh, in the case of Blue Hole in New Mexico, the diving conditions are almost always the same. It's 63 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit, and the visibility is roughly the same most of the time, unless a lot of people have been in there stirring it up. Uh, but it's usually, you know, at least 30 or 40 feet. So it's pretty good um, for inland water. And uh, now, and, and so the, the but, but in the ocean, if you're in the Caribbean, you might be expecting 80 foot visibility and you could get in the water and you could have 30 foot visibility because of a storm surge or whatever. And that can change the experience you're gonna have. And we're not talking about only canceling dives, we're talking about enjoying the dives that we get. So how do we manage that? And so the, if, you're, if you're trying to, uh, or if you're expecting to dive in a specific situation, and that situation doesn't exist, then you have to understand the situation that does exist and how can you get the most out of it. So if you're expecting that 80 foot visibility and it's 20 feet, what are you gonna do differently? You know, you're not gonna have the grand vistas underwater that you might've had otherwise. So you're gonna have to get closer to the reef. You're gonna have to enjoy uh, experiences that are more macro, you know, in, in terms of close up to use the photography term, um, and you might uh, dive a specific smaller part of the reef and just focus on the, the smaller creatures that you can see, you know? So uh, the conditions in the water can, in terms of visibility and things like that, you can ac accommodate in your dive plan and you can make changes so that you can still enjoy the dive even if it isn't the dive that you were expecting. Uh, the reef condition, that's out of our control. Uh, <laughs> on the dive level, it's out of our control. Definitely, there are a lot of things we can do to take care of our reefs, and we should be doing those things. But we're talking about, you know, I'm on the boat ready to dive. The condition of the reef is not always, is not going to be in our control. So based on the dive briefing, how do we enjoy that dive? Uh, wildlife cooperation, and I say cooperation, but basically you don't get to predict what wildlife you're going to see on every dive. You know, you might be very lucky and be in a place where there's a routine that you can count on. Um, and if you dive with dive masters in a specific location, they will dive there enough so they know where the frogfish is. They know where the seahorse is. They know where the octopus lives. And they know where the mores are, whatever, you know, those, those kinds of things that people you know, like to see and they like to point out, those might, you know, they dive often enough. So if those creatures move, the dive masters, a lot of times they'll find, they'll know where they move to or they'll find them because they go dive to dive to dive and they keep track of them. Well, um, you, but you still don't get to predict necessarily everything you're going to see. And you're going to have to just learn to, you just have to adapt to that and enjoy what you can. Um, and, and I think it's important because a lot of times we'll get in the water with an expectation of, I wanna see this, and I'm so busy looking for turtles that I don't see cuttlefish, or that I don't see some other really cool, uh, really cool piece of coral or 
really cool formation uh, or you know whatever else that's something that that going into the water with an understanding of what we can expect to see but also backing away enough from that expectation that you can enjoy what you have you know what you do get instead of spending the entire dive looking for sharks and not see anything because you weren't looking at what was already there the other thing that can happen with diving conditions is the topside weather you know we don't have control of the topside weather in new mexico i would have it, it the topside weather in the in the summer can be blazing hot on the high plains out there and in the winter it can be snow i've been in blue hole i've been i've been diving in the snow uh, which is actually it's not too bad you just don't want to get out of the water even though it's 64 degrees because it's warmer than the environment that you're going into uh, so that's part of it though uh, understanding the topside weather what to expect and if that changes how can you adapt and so when you're traveling, layering is really good, at least having clothes that you can layer. You know, if you're going to a Caribbean destination or some other warm equatorial climate, that's great. I would still take long pants and a long sleeve shirt that you can layer over whatever else you're wearing because if it's late in the day or if the weather for whatever reason happens to be cooler or you're going out on a boat, which people don't always understand that once you're out over the water, a lot of times it will be significantly cooler than it was back on shore. You might get sunburned because of reflection, but you're still going to be cooler than you were on the shore because uh, it's just cooler on the boats. Sometimes it's not always true, but being prepared for that is important. All right, so um, that's topside weather. And the number four thing that I, I think can cause disappointment and, and cause dives to not go as well as they might otherwise is personal health and fitness. And so what we want to do is make sure that we are staying fit, we're eating right, and we're getting enough sleep, we're staying hydrated. Those things are really important to a good dive. And when we're traveling, sometimes any number of those things can be difficult to keep in mind. Now, your overall fitness level isn't going to change because of a couple of days, you know, of not going to the gym or not working out in your home or whatever you do. But, but we can lose track of our routines where we're not sleeping well, especially if we're jet lagged or if we're, you know, if we're traveling a, a far distance from our homes um, or the environmental conditions are significantly different. Maybe it's much warmer where we're going then where we're coming from here in Colorado, it's October, it's cool. If I were to go to the equator, it would be nice and warm, uh, which might be uncomfortable. I might not sleep as well. And so we can lose track of our sleep schedules. We can lose track of our eating and, and, and uh, drinking schedules in terms of drinking water. Uh, and, and we can also be eating food we're not familiar with and we can give ourselves stomach problems. I'm not saying by any stretch not to eat local food. I want you to enjoy your trip in every aspect. Everything you wanted to enjoy about the trip, I want you to enjoy. But what I also want you to do is remember that, um, you know, we can't just eat. I was going to say you can't just eat whatever's out there. And what's important is to remember that there are balanced things that help us be at our best, you know, and, and having fruits and vegetables and stuff that really fuels our body in addition to whatever might be uh, really exciting about the location that you're in. If it's not fruits and vegetables, <laughs> um, that's, you know, we need to remember that so that we can keep our body in uh, as good a shape as we can for diving. Staying hydrated is really important. And, Staying hydrated is really important. That's not going to make good audio pro programming, but that's okay. All right. Hydration and keeping a water bottle near you, whether it's your own water bottle like this one, or whether you, you just need to remember to, to refill uh, a, or reuse a water bottle if you can, to keep yourself hydrated that's one of the biggest things you can do to enjoy your dives is stay hydrated. All right. The other thing I wanted to touch on is sometimes you're just not feeling it. 
and you're not, you just don't want to dive. And that's, that's okay. That it is way better to say, you know what, I don't want to dive today than to, um, to dive when you don't want to be in the water because that puts yourself and your dive buddy at risk. So, and what I, what I would say with that is, you know, I want in 2005, I went to Bonaire and uh, there, I think I was there for 10 days and, and one day I just didn't want to dive. I was, and I don't know if I was just tired. I mean, we had been diving and diving and diving and diving, which is awesome. I don't know if I was just tired or if I was just needed a break, whatever. But I told my dive buddy, you know, and, and we were in a fairly large group, so it wasn't going to significantly impact my dive buddy's experience. But I was like, you know what? I'm not going to dive Wednesday or whatever, and I'm just going to walk around and take pictures and hang out, whatever. So I think it, it's important to understand that you might not, even if you're a scuba evangelist, you might not always want to dive, and that's okay. The last thing I want to say about health and fitness is that your buddy is entitled to every single thing that you are entitled to, which means that they might not be sleeping well, they might not be eating right, they might not be staying hydrated, whatever those things are, we need to, as a good dive buddy, we need to be respecting what they're feeling as well and be prepared to either take the day off with them, if it's a significant other or, or a, um, a dive buddy that, that uh, you really wanna spend time with, that's great, go do something else that day. If it's not, you can go to your group or to the dive operator and say, hey, I need to be, I'm, I'm singled up today, I need to find a dive buddy. And most, most dive operators will help you find a buddy uh, in those situations. So kind of putting all of that together or, or those four issues that come up that you can think about are travel issues, gear issues, diving conditions, and personal health and fitness. And keeping on top of those things as you get ready to go on a trip and what can you look forward in the future or what can you look into and say, okay, what, um, how do I reduce the odds that this is going to be a problem when I get on the ground, wherever I'm going? Uh, and then how do I respond to it when it becomes a problem? Is it something I want to try and fix? Uh, is it something that, you know, maybe you are really, 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 really tied to diving your own camera and, or diving with your camera. And if the camera doesn't work, you don't want to dive. That's a really bad example, because if your camera doesn't work, just go enjoy the dive. But just for the sake of the argument here, if you're really tied to a piece of gear for whatever reason, whether it's comfort in the water, maybe, you know, maybe you're just more comfortable in the water with your gear and you don't want to dive if your gear isn't working that's okay. Just have a plan for what you're going to do if it doesn't work so that you can still enjoy your trip and get the most out or get as much out of it as you can, even if you can't get in the water. All right. So I promised that we could do three tips to prevent missed dives. So let's talk about what those things might be. We've kind of covered some of this before uh, earlier in this podcast, and I've certainly talked about some of these in past episodes. The first thing is to check your gear. When I was getting ready to go to New Mexico, I got my dry suit out. I hadn't been diving in it in quite a while. Put it on, rip neck seal, okay? I put it on long enough in advance so that I could, you know, correct it if there was a problem. And then you get it corrected and then hopefully get back in the pool after it's corrected, which I did. And that's when I discovered my dry suit was leaking and so, you know, sometimes it's an iterative process because if I had gotten in the water with a uh, torn neck seal, I wouldn't have known it leaked from the zipper or the valve because the neck seal would have been leaking too much. So you have to check your gear in advance enough to get it replaced or repaired prior to your trip. And I, I wanna reemphasize one thing is putting it on uh, in your living room will find torn neck seals. Putting it on in your living room is not going to find whether or not it leaks or whether or not it's functioning in the water. So that's one of the, the things that's really important is that once you get that first level check, you get your, your gear bag out of your closet or your garage or your basement, you do the spider check, and then you put it on, find some time in the pool. Get down to your local dive shop 
or whatever pool you can find to get into and test your gear out that, that way so that you really know that it's working underwater with a tank attached, ready to go. All right, so that's tip number one. Always check your gear in advance far enough to get it repaired or replaced. Take care of your own health and wellness. This is making sure you're getting enough sleep, eating well, staying hydrated, and staying fit. Easy enough. And then plan for contingencies. So this is not just about go, no go decisions. This is about getting the most out of whatever diving conditions that we have. So if we have that low visibility situation where we're, we're normally 80 degrees, you know, 80 foot visibility, that's the kind of diving we like to do. That's great. What if the visibility is 20 feet? What are you going to do? Are you going to skip the dive? That's fine. That's a decision you can make. Or are you going to be able to adapt to a 20 foot visibility dive? And that's, you know, that's the question. And it isn't a question of judgment or a judgment of what any specific diver wants to do. You could be diving with a buddy who is going to be very uncomfortable in 20 foot visibility. And we need to respect that. So that means your dive buddy's probably not going to want to dive if that if that's the condition. What do you do about that? So have a plan to say, okay, I'm going to talk to the dive operator if the visibility is 20 feet. And reconcile yourself to that. Say, hey, that's okay. I might not be able to dive with my buddy because of whatever condition that might exist. Um, rough water, stuff like that. Um, Getting in and out of a boat when the when, it, when there's six foot swells can be kind of an interesting adventure. And are you up for that? Those kind of things you need to be ready to adapt to. And, you know, if you're rough water and you're like me and you get seasick, that's kind of a bummer. But how do you deal with that? Are you going to need uh, Dramamine? Are you going to use C-bands? Are you going to use, uh, what's that other one? It doesn't matter. Um, relief band. Uh, and uh, see what, you know, what is your, what is your, recovery plan from that particular condition. The other thing I want to touch on with this, with this whole planning for contingencies piece is understand your single points of failure. You know, what is, if something fails that will stop you from diving, what is it? And is that replaceable at the dive shop at the, at, at, at your destination? You know, at most resorts, you're going to get recreational gear, but you might not get your dive computer. You might not get your BC or whatever. And this might not seem as big a deal to, to you, but, um, you know, your mask, that's a pretty, that's a very personal piece of equipment and, and a, a good fitting mask makes a big difference in the water. So, uh, what are the single points of failure and how can you minimize them? So in the case of a mask, you can get a box to put the mask in or keep the box box it came in and, and put it in that box to travel, reduce the chance that it's going to get broken. Things like that can really help. So what tips do you have to save a dive? And put those in the comments and let's hear them. All right. So I want to hear from you. Uh, you can email me or find me on Twitter and Instagram. There will be links in the description below. Uh, don't miss out on an episode. You can find the Under Pressure Dive Cast on your favorite podcatcher. If you found this <laughs> if you found this episode helpful, let me know that you liked it with that by hitting that thumbs up button. If the episode wasn't helpful to you, I would really like to know that too and help me make this better by contacting me and letting me know what I can do to improve the show to help it make a better resource for the dive community. Thank you for diving in with me today here on YouTube or on the podcast. On the left over there, you'll see a playlist with more episodes of the Under Pressure Divecast. If you enjoyed this video, please uh, subscribe and hit the button in the middle of the screen over there or uh, subscribe on your podcast.